So I've told you also that lysogens are immune to superinfection. And so homoimmune phages will not form plaques efficiently on a strain that carries a homoimmune prophage. But there's lots of other reasons why bacteriophages will fail to infect a particular bacterium. So I just wanted to briefly uh, uh, think about those. Um, phages are typically quite specific for their bacterial hosts. E. coli phages do not, none that I'm aware of, are able to infect bacillus, for example. Now, there are phages that will infect all sorts of different types of E. coli, phages that may infect E. coli and salmonella. So there's a variety of infectious patterns. But there is this notion of specificity. And the spectrum of hosts that can be infected uh, is typically referred to as the host range. And so different bacteriophages have different host ranges and you can essentially think of these as being overlapping sets of host preferences for bacteriophages. Most bacteria actually have phages that have been recognized and isolated. Perhaps not all, but most. And the question remains for those for which phages have not yet been identified. I think I'm not sure there are any phages of Francisella, for example. But I'll bet you that you can find them. Um, I mentioned that this, this host range can be, it can be quite broad. For example, there are bacteriophages that infect both fast-growing and slow-growing mycobacteria, even though those strains are remarkably different to each other in growth rate, if no other reason. But there's bacteriophages that will only infect a few subtypes of Staphylococcus strains, for example. So it can be very, very narrow host range, or it can be reasonably broad. So if we think about why a bacteriophage may not infect the host, there's a number of different reasons. There simply may be the lack of a receptor or a specific target site for recognition for that phage on the outside of that host. The phage may simply not be able to replicate its DNA in that host, even if the DNA can get in. The genes may not be expressed. And of course, as I mentioned, if there is a homoimmune prophage, that would be an additional reason why you would fail to get infection. But probably the principal reason why bacteriophages don't infect hosts other than the ones that they do infect the principal reason is likely to be that simply the DNA does not get in. The receptor, the receptor machinery is not there for recognition and introduction of the DNA. So um, I just want to uh, think a little bit about, um, to broaden out and think about what phages look like and how they appear out there uh, in the environment and how many are there and how prevalent are they. Where are they? And so, um, uh, Curtis Seppel and, and, and colleagues and, and many different groups have utilized um, a staining, a fluorescence staining method, an, an epifluorescence uh, microscopy, to look at the presence of viral particles in environmental samples. And this is an example of what they see. So, there's you can see green dots on the slide, right? And this is just a sample of seawater that's been stained with cyber green. And the fluorescence enables you to see, essentially, the entirety of the um, small particles present. And you can see there's two different sized particles. There's relatively big, bright green ones. And then there's all these smaller ones. The bright, larger green ones, these guys here, these are the prokaryotic cells in this sample. This is from some seawater sample. I don't remember which one, but this is very common. And the smaller particles are the viruses, the bacteriophages. So there's two important things that have come from this kind of analysis. The first is, is that 
you can see the ratio of the bacteriophages to the bacteria is about 10 to 1. There's about tenfold more viral particles than there are bacteriophages. And that ratio is typical no matter where people have looked. It's not always exactly 10 to 1, it's 5 to 1. It's always, typically, it's more viral particles than bacteria, and it's in that range, no matter where people have looked. The other thing is, is that this rather simple method enables you, without having to have a host, without having to reproduce the viruses, without having to do a plaque test, to estimate how many particles are present. You simply stain them, put them under the microscope, and you count them. When you do that, uh, it is typical to find about 10 to the 6 or 10 to the power of 7 viral-like particles per mil. And this has been done from some um, terrestrial samples, but extensively from water samples and seawater samples. And although, again, the numbers vary, the numbers are in, those, in that range, whether you're coastal or mid-sea, whether you're near the surface, or whether you're uh, many, many feet down um, in the ocean. And so um, when this became apparent, it was pretty simple for people to do the calculation as to if you've got 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 7 viral particles per mil, you can figure out how many mils there are, throw in a few fetch factors for um, for, for, for terrestrial uh, concentrations. And what you end up with is the astonishing number that there's 10 to the power of 31 viral-like particles, bacteriophages predominantly, in the biosphere. And this is remarkable for a number of reasons. First of all, it's a very big number. And um, it's an unimaginably big number. And, and my uh, colleague, Roger Hendricks in Pittsburgh, has a device that one of many that he uses to help us think about what that looks like. So as Roger would explain, if we imagine that each viral particle is about 100 nanometers in length, which is probably not far off, we can simply imagine what kind of linear array we would get from taking 10 to the power of 31 of those and stacking them end to end on top of each other, how far would that go? And the answer is amazing. If you started doing that on the floor of the auditorium here, and you extended this long linear array out through the rather remarkable uh, roof of the very remarkable Genelia Farms, out through the uh, uh, clear blue sky and beyond, you would get a linear array that stretches out past our solar system for a total distance of 200 million light years. It is an astonishingly large number. And so those early studies of Doral and Twork that showed that these uh, particles existed in nature uh, really was um, additionally beautiful as discovery uh, from the perspective that there are so many of these around that it's amazing that, that they escaped discovery 